last time on Truth or Myth Beta Cannon. Starfleet Command, in the process of upgrading their fleet, was shocked when the Federation Council refused their request for further resources to construct six new starship designs, and were told to go back to the drawing board and come up with new starships not so resource intensive. And Dr. Richard Daystrom, certified mentally fit once again, was determined to solve this problem for Starfleet, in order to clear the now-tainted institute that held his name. In order to do this, he turned to a 100-year-old starship design forgotten in a Starfleet decommissioned shipyard. The question for Daystrom now is, could his plan for the institute's redemption work? Well, stay tuned and find out. Hello and welcome to another episode of Truth or Myth Beta Canon, a Star Trek web series that dives into the history of any given topic using Beta Canon sources and my own imagination to fill in the gaps. In today's episode, we're taking a look at part two of my video on the Columbia class from Star Trek Online to better understand its place in Star Trek history. Please note, this video is an update of an older two-part video I made a long time ago. And if you haven't seen part one yet, a link to that video is in the description below. Being a favorite video of mine, I had always intended to update it when I had a 3D model worthy of remaking the video. And thanks once again to that guy Andreas, that day is finally here. Now, this is my own little bit of fan fiction for the design, and I think it makes sense as a redemption tale of a brilliant man with no disrespect meant towards Star Trek Online at all. But of course, as always, because this is just a little bit of my own fan fiction mixed with beta canon, all information relayed in this video should pretty much be taken with a grain of stardust, and only considered a little bit of Star Trek fun. And so, with all that out of the way, let's begin. From the Starfleet Historical Archive, Personal Journal Entry, Dr. Richard Daystrom, Stardate 7621.8 I had that dream again. I'm aboard the USS Excalibur in the captain's chair. Everything is calm and peaceful until suddenly the ship shakes violently. Turning in the chair, I'm confronted by the first officer, whose look of shock and surprise makes my stomach turn. I try to turn away to look at something else, anything else, but I can't, I'm frozen. And even as the first officer's flesh begins to melt away, I still can't turn away. And only after she's a pile of burning sludge do I feel a hand on my back turning the chair, and it's the Excalibur's captain, face also melting in a horrible melange of flesh and blood, crying out over the streams, you Daystrom, you did this. And it's at that point I wake up, with the words, Your mighty starships, four toys to be crushed as we choose, ringing in my ears. I can never fully atone for what I have done, but I must try. I must find a way to quiet the screams of the 400 dead and restore faith in my legacy. For if I do, perhaps, the dead will let me have one night of uninterrupted sleep. But how? How can I make up for the damage that I've done? End of log. Dr. Richard Daystrom's plan to solve Starfleet's starship problem was coming together nicely. By utilizing an already constructed, albeit reinforced, hull design, he would satisfy the Vulcans and their concerns. But a lot of work still had to be done in order to get the NX-Class refit up to par with Starfleet's current design specs. Setting to work with his team, Daystrom began to formulate the plan based on the needs of Starfleet Command for this starship design. First, Starfleet wanted a starship that, like the Miranda-Class, could fill a multitude of roles. But, unlike the Miranda-Class, the Columbia class would be a cargo and transport vessel only. Laying out the internal areas of the starship, Daystrom and his team decided to take the modular approach that Starfleet had begun using in all its starship designs. 
By making components removable, Starfleet was able to easily upgrade various aspects of the new Starship designs. The Miranda class, for example, could have a roll bar removed from its standard configuration, replaced with various other pods specifically designed to change the role of that starship. And Daystrom felt that this approach could give this new design of the Institutes the edge required to win the Federation Council and Starfleet over. Technology used currently by Starfleet, though more complex, was much smaller and more compact than even what had been used 20 years prior in the Constitution class, thus making more available internal space which could be utilized by this new design. And so, looking at the lower decks of the saucer section of the Starship, Daystrom and his team designed four removable modules, which could, in theory, be ejected and replaced in only a few hours of being docked at a starbase. The first module designed would be a cargo module. This module would be designed with variable environmental controls, and basically be a huge open area cargo bay, allowing for the transport of various materials throughout the Federation. The second module was designed for the transport of persons. This module would be separated by decks and contain multiple cabins in one, two, and family travel sizes. Daystrom also included variable environmental controls for each cabin, going far beyond Starfleet's current design level. In fact, the environmental controls per cabin could be altered so extensively that even a Tholian could ride comfortably in this new design. The third module designed would be for massive personnel or troop transportation, with large barrack-style rooms. Each module design would also contain its own personal transporter, powered by its own miniature reactor. In case of main power failure, these transporters would still work, giving the passengers and crew a better chance for survival. The engineering hall would remain as it was, though Daystrom would insist that specially designed explosive bolts be added as backup to allow the starship to discard the engineering section if necessary. The original engineering room in the saucer section was converted to a state-of-the-art impulse engineering room, while the upper decks of the saucer section were converted to crew quarters, sick bay, scientific and recreational facilities. Due to improvements in computer control and components, this design only required 10 officers to effectively control the ship. However, the standard crew complement was 52 officers and crew members. A fourth pod would also be designed by Daystrom and Company, which would allow the starship to be easily converted to a hospital ship though this module would never be constructed. The second requirement by Starfleet was in the design aesthetic. Starfleet Command was going for a complete fleet-wide overhaul of its look in order to not appear old and stagnant. And so, in keeping with Starfleet's current design look, the original NX-class refit hull paint would be stripped down to its white underlayer. Sections of it would be polished while other sections of the hull would receive a shiny pearlized coating. The final touch was the only major component that had to be replaced, that of the NX-class refits nacelles. These were detached and a new nacelle design, based on the nacelles carried by the Oberth class, would be incorporated. These new nacelles, though appearing like the Oberths, were nothing of the sort. All their internal components were redesigned by the Institute, in hopes that this new design would give the Columbia class an edge over her Oberth sisters in speed. With the plans all drawn up, Daystrom met with Admiral Robert April and Starfleet Command and presented the new design to the Admiralty. Unsure of what to expect, Daystrom was pleasantly surprised when the Columbia class was met with resounding amazement from all. Starfleet Command immediately voted to present the new design to the Federation Council, but had one request, the addition of weapons to the design. Daystrom, perhaps wanting to make up for his past mistake, had not included any weapons on the Columbia class, and was dead set against them being added to the design. Back at the Institute, however, 
His closest friends were able to convince him that weapons were a necessity of sorts to have on any starship, even if it was only minimal weaponry. Raiders, space entities, and enemy vessels were still prevalent throughout the galaxy, and to send a starship out without weapons would significantly reduce the chances of that starship's survival. And with this logic, Daystrom would agree to eight phaser emitters and two photon torpedo launchers to be incorporated into his design. With the plans finalized and Starfleet's approval, the Admiralty then presented the new design to the Federation Council. Impressed with how Starfleet was utilizing an old starship design and needing few resources to bring this new design to life, Sarek of Vulcan immediately moved that the design be approved and the required resources allocated at once for construction to commence. And with the great sway of the Vulcan ambassador, the motion was passed, and construction did indeed commence. And when finally completed, Daystrom and his team would not only be invited to the christening ceremony, but also to participate in the shakedown cruise itself. The entire design was a complete success. Everything Daystrom and his team had designed worked exactly as expected. Modules could be removed and installed in less than three hours, and even the Starship's engines performed above expectations, reaching a standard cruising velocity of warp factor 6 with an emergency maximum speed of warp factor 7. It was a true triumph for Dr. Richard Daystrom and the Institute which held his name, and it did in fact restore Starfleet's faith in the Institute and its abilities. To this day, the Daystrom Institute continues to work closely with Starfleet Command, creating new and brilliant technologies while refining older ones. A truly amazing relationship for the two organizations. As for Daystrom himself, he would be somewhat forgiven by history often referred to as a brilliant man who simply made a mistake. He would die almost a year after the USS Columbia's launch, and would be given a state's funeral by Starfleet in his honor. From the Starfleet Historical Archive, Personal Journal Entry, Dr. Richard Daystrom, Stardate 7811.6 I had that blasted dream again, the one where I'm on the Excalibur, with the crew melting away. Waking up in terror as usual, I was suddenly shocked to find myself at complete calm. Something has changed. I know that. I feel that. I've begun to put my affairs in order, as I believe my time here in this universe is almost at an end. And I meet that end head on. If the laws of God and man are to be believed, then perhaps God will forgive me and show me mercy for my past deeds. If not, if I am to burn in hell for eternity, then I accept my fate and hope that those that I've harmed in the wake of my bad decisions will find some comfort in that. They say space is the final frontier, but I believe that to be incorrect. Rather, death is the final frontier where all the questions of the universe are answered. So more not for me, for this is just a shell, and my human adventure is just about to begin. End of log. That was Dr. Richard Daystrom's final journal entry. He was found in his bed the night that the journal entry was made, having passed away from a heart attack during the night. The only odd thing about his death that was reported was that Daystrom was found with a smile on his face. Thank you for watching today's episode of Truth or Myth Beta Canon. What do you think of the events surrounding the Columbia class and the narrative that I've created here? How do you feel about Dr. Richard Daystrom? Do you want to see more videos like this one? Well, leave your comments in the section below. And don't forget to like the video and subscribe to the channel, hitting that little bell icon so you won't miss a single video we release. Once again, I'd like to say a huge thank you to that guy Andreas for all their hard work and providing me with these awesome 3D models. 
so check out their DeviantArt link in the description below and send them some of the love that they deserve. Want to help the channel tell more stories like this one? Then consider becoming a channel patron. The link to our Patreon account is in the description below. Thanks again for watching, live long, and prosper.